covers a wide variety of areas, only some of which I work in myself. Marianne Ferber and I had to come up with a definition at one point because we were doing a little survey. And we called it um, work having to do with uh, economic roles of men and women that have a uh, liberatory bent, that is, doesn't just reinforce uh, gender stereotypes, uh, and work on the definition and methodology of economics that shows gender biases uh, there. The methodology tends to be a lot wider rather than um, focusing on applying a specific set of tools that you learn in graduate school to whatever problem comes up, which often um, ends up being forcing a problem into an artificial uh, state in order to be analyzable by those models. Uh, feminist economists, for the most part, are willing to uh, look across a, a broader variety of methods. So we have people who do standard um, you know, wage equation econometrics. We also have people who do you know, interviews, qualitative data, literary analysis, uh, combinations of all of this. I recently worked on a project that combined statistical meta-analysis with research I had to do in philosophy and linguistics about how people were interpreting uh, the way the results of the uh, empirical analysis was phrased. So um, yeah, I think we have a, a, a bigger toolbox uh, of which more standard models and uh, methods are, are only one. My sort of um, approach to doing science, social science, I think is it should be a systematic, open-minded investigation about a problem. I mean, if it's not about some kind of problem, you know, it's a mind game and, and you might enjoy doing it, but I don't see what the, what the social usefulness of it is. So if you've got a problem you want to address, um, then you have to look around for what tools seem to, you know, give you the most insight while being uh, least distorting of the problem. At least that's the kind of guideline I've used for my own work. I actually associate it with um, institutionalist economics and some of that overlap with uh, American pragmatist philosophy. Uh, John Dewey and you know, some of those folks. Um, uh, and then the, the early institutionalists. I actually went to University of Wisconsin-Madison, which was a big uh, place for John R. Commons and, and those folks. But they also, um, John R. Commons didn't leave like a, a cogent theory for institutions to follow. It was more the pattern of his life, which was find a problem you know, bring together the people that might know something about it, even if some are workers and some are capitalists, you know, get them in the, you know, talking about it. Um, so it's a different kind of approach. Well, yes, we started, a lot of us in feminist economics, um, really starting to critique models of labor markets and the household. Um, you know, definitely, you know, pioneered by Gary Becker and this. Uh, but a lot of those models seem to just kind of, ex you know, explain away and reinforce you know, sexist behavior, that, you know, women were supposed to specialize in the home because of comparative advantage. Um, uh, women would get less wages in the workforce because of lower human capital and, and you know, various other things. Uh, times have been changing since then. I mean, women now get more college degrees than men. It's hard to fall back on that, you know, women are less educated uh, 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 reason anymore. And I think there was a lot of progress in uh, raising issues of, uh, um, you know, more issues of, uh, for a while there's a lot of progress of uh, raising issues of discrimination in economics. Although some of my um, feminist economics colleagues did a uh, analysis of the use of the word discrimination. I kind of peaked in the, I think, late 70s and 80s and has been on the downswing in economics uh, journals ever since. Uh, it's not a hot, as hot a topic. People tend to now refer to an unexplained wage gap that could be due to lots of things. Less likely to mention discrimination. Um, Household models, there was um, <coughs> the uh, introduction bargaining theory, uh, which at least means that there's two active people in the household, not just a household head, which was some amount of progress. Uh, some amount of you know, listening across disciplines to other things on, on households. Um, on the other hand, I think there's been some swing back. And this, some of the work I've been doing in the last couple years was looking at what seems to be a, a resurgence of stereotyping about women and women's abilities. Um, one indicator of this was um, Larry Summers, uh, economist when he was president of Harvard, said at an MIT conference that maybe one of the reasons there's fewer women in science is that women are not as able uh, in doing that, which was a pretty shocking thing to come out of uh, you know, a university president to say, you know, I can imagine what the science students at Harvard itself felt like feeling their president undercut their abilities. So he got in a lot of hot water for that. Um, but the field of behavioral economics is also uh, fairly new. Um, 
Some of it I think is pretty good. Some of it I think uh, takes credit for reinventing psychology. I mean, things that social psychologists and psychologists have been doing for years. But there's been some literature coming out of that saying, well, uh, women are less competitive, women are more whisk averse, women are, are more altruistic. And with hints there that that then explains things like the wage gap and the lack of women in, in leadership positions. Um, so I think there's been some um, you know, kind of backlash swing. And my last couple uh, years in this, this uh, meta-analysis I looked at was um, these phrases like women are more risk averse than men. Philosophy and linguistics tells us they're, they're, they're considered to be generic statements about categorical differences, like ducks lay eggs. Actually, only the minority of ducks lay eggs, only the mature females, most duck, ducks don't lay eggs. Women are more risk averse, people tend to think of that as categorical, women over here, men over there. I looked back at the statistical data on which this was based, and the two distributions are, are almost entirely overlapping. It's like at least 80%, sometimes 90, 96% overlap between the distributions. Tiny, perhaps statistically significant difference in means. Uh, but most of men and women are really a lot more similar than different. Yet if you, you read the titles of these uh, books or these articles, you would be getting a big misperception. Well, I, th I think behavioral economics has good aspects and bad aspects. Um, the part that I think is positive and does parallel some of the critique in feminist economics is the critique of rationality. Uh, that we, our brains did not evolve to solve logic problems. <laughs> our brains evolved to keep us and our species going and you know, reacts in ways that, that do not um, come from optim you know, mathematical optimization problems. And so there's been some looking into that. I think there's a couple, two things that I, I see as a little bit more negative. One is that behavioral economics tends to focus on problems of individual choice. And I think that is much too narrow a definition of economics. Um, uh, inequality, poverty, climate change. Um, there may be some individual choice aspects of those problems, but I also think economists need to be uh, concerned with a lot of these um, bigger economic problems that go beyond individual choice problems. Uh, the other part is um, that some of this has a, a conservative um, confirmation bias, uh, sex, sexist stereotyping bent. Um, these studies that purport to say that women and men have um, uh, very different uh, socio socio-cognitive um, uh, abilities and preferences, which turn out to be uh, quite unfounded. Well, one more point. They, they have critiqued the idea that the agent is rational, but they haven't critiqued the idea that the economist is rational. <laughs> <laughs> so they tend to still believe in the, you know, the power of the models and their own objectivity. And in this work I've been doing on, on gender and risk aversion, I've also been coming up with very blatant examples of confirmation bias. People finding exactly the belief they had in the beginning, uh, really in spite of the empirical evidence that they had gathered themselves. I would say, I mean, the mainstream has integrated very little. <laughs> um, they did, I actually got asked to do a book review for Journal of Economic Literature, it came out in the last issue. I mean, every once in a while we get a little bit in something of the, the main mainstream journals, um, but there's certainly no feeling that it needs to be uh, taught among there. Um, I would say that the feminist economics got welcomed more quickly by a lot of the sort of heterodox schools, the kind of socioeconomic, uh, humanistic economics, uh, the Marxist economics, uh, some of those. Um, I think the macro people kind of doing post-Keynesian, maybe a little bit later, they didn't see their work uh, as relevant. There have also been some economists who call themselves pluralist economists and include feminists in, um, you know, whenever they list the various schools, who I don't think have actually read it. <laughs> when they go to talk about it, they talk about it as if it's, you know, the study of women's and women's issues and have not looked at the feminist methodological uh, critiques. So um, some friendliness, but not necessarily knowledge or uh, the willingness to spend time learning what we're about. There is a, a, a big area in uh, feminist work, um, usually goes under the term intersectionality. <laughs> that is, how does gender uh, interlace with class, interlace with caste, ethnicity, immigration status, nationality, race, all the rest of these things. Um, I think of the feminist analysis as a particular way in. Um, there are a lot of people who do a lot of work more on those fronts than I do. I tend to, um, I, I, I think that the, the, the gender aspect has been a key part of the, um, uh, the gender aspect is, is kind of a, along with explanations coming from economic power and class, I think 
together explain a lot of the uh, power of the, um, the mainstream in economics. That is, partly it is supported because it kind of throws a smokescreen over some inequality issues and such we would rather not look at uh, for the most part. And, you know, may justify, uh, like in the U.S., these CEO ridiculous salaries, you know, somebody will spout a, a free market sort of thing on that. Uh, but there's then also, I think, a, a psychological one that it does seem to be, you know, more macho, more rigorous, somehow more scientific, and builds this big, you know, barrier of math, you know. Well, you don't understand the policy because you don't, you know, you can't read this, this journal article, um, which I think is rather, rather silly. And if, if um, you know, it's more revealed that the emperor has no clothes on that aspect, uh, it may be. These are not down. I don't believe so. Uh, at least the, um, I think, that, I mean, the attitude of the mainstream, and even people that are a little bit, you know, kind of around the edges of the mainstream a little bit more, you know, people like, like say, Paul Krugman or Joe Stiglitz that, you know, take the mainstream to task on certain things, uh, have not really gotten the gender uh, angle uh, at all. Um, and then the bulk of economists, I think, are quite uh, unreflective about the source of the models and methodology. It just seems to them naturally obvious that this is the rigorous uh, way to go about it. And anybody who doesn't believe them is just, you know, uh, not up to snuff. The curriculum is, is something that I've done some work on uh, myself, um, just at the uh, introductory university level, and uh, with a little bit of an intervention to, uh, into to high school teaching. Um, because even people who, who say some rather sensible things, I'm thinking here of, of Paul Krugman again, if you look at the, tex the textbook, at least the early editions of the textbook that I looked at were that much different from you know, the, the more standard mainstream ones. Um, the projects I worked on with uh, Neva Goodwin and others uh, called Economics in Context or Micro or Macro Economics in Context um, shifted the introductory curriculum a bit more but not to the point where it would become um, not the thing that people expect intro econ students to have. That is, we, we kept teaching some of the same things, supply and demand models, you know, consumer, producer, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but we made some big switches. Well, one is we taught them as models. We taught them as uh, ways people have thought up of trying to think about markets uh, or trying to think about firms or consumers. And then went on to pre present other things. So, s example, in the, ch the chapter on consumption, we also talked about um, uh, the rise of consumer credit, uh, kind of consumerist attitudes, consu uh, effects of consumption on the on uh, ecological matters. Um, after you know introducing the you know mainstream you know neoclassical economic schools because this way, and then there's these other big economic issues having uh, to do with it. We also introduced things like um, uh, public goods and externalities in chapter one. Uh, discuss income inequality. I think it's around chapter three or four. A lot of books do it, but it's like chapter 18 that you never get to. Um, and uh, uh, most economics textbooks say that your uh, three, three economic activities are production, distribution, and consumption. And we added one on the beginning. We called it, uh, called it resource maintenance. That sounds quite neutral. Uh, but the standard economic approach never tells you where uh, natural resources or workers come from. They just kind of pop up or where waste products and sick people and old people go. They just kind of poof, disappear. Well, these are really the subjects of ecological and uh, uh, feminist economics to the extent it looks at women's traditional work in you know, raising children, taking care of uh, sick and elderly. So by, by bringing in resource maintenance, we can bring in a whole lot of things about um, sustainability and, uh, and gender uh, from the beginning. The definition of economics that we use in the books is um, something that's called a provisioning definition. That is, economics about, is about how societies organize themselves to provide for the survival and flourishing of life. Or, sometimes at the end I put, or fail to do so. <laughs> Some economies uh, fail to do that. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the tendencies within economics are to define it as choice, you know, choice in, the, in the face of scarcity or as markets. And I think both of those are, are too narrow. I was just talking to a group of uh, teenagers from various European schools in Brussels last week. And the two issues that caught them um, you know, seemed to, to have their interest, one of which, one of them was inequality. But the other one that got even more interest, actually the question I asked them was, what do you wish economists were doing better? After I kind of described you know, what economists do. And, and one issue that came up was inequality. Uh, but the other one was climate change. 
I mean, the next generation are the people that are going to have to live with these decisions that are going on. Um, and the science has become indisputable, except by people who are choosing to <laughs> close their ears. Uh, but in a lot of countries, the, the shift then has gone to, well, what's the you know, economically optimal way uh, uh, to do this? U.S. tends to be you know, far behind uh, most of Europe on this. Um, it's gotten phrased in the U.S. Of, of, you know, how do we address climate, climate change without it costing too much in terms of GDP? Uh, so a friend of mine, Frank Ackerman, has written a book, uh, written a book entitled, Can We Afford the Future? You know, is the future going to cost us too much? Um, which is kind of a silly way of, you know, uh, of looking at it. Um, I don't think economists should be making the decision about how fast to adjust. I think that needs to come from you know, science and you know, dem you know, democratic political decision making. I think actually you know, there is a role for standard economic models in this. I see them um, mostly more at the line of, of cost benefit. Or, uh, not, you can't, it's hard to quantify the benefits. So, um, so that's, I don't think, a strong point of economics here, but cost-effectiveness analysis. That is, standard economics tools could be very useful in saying, well, should we push for more you know, wind versus solar next? Okay, that is something that some of the standard tools could work on. Uh, but the, the larger issues of you know, how fast to move and, and, and how to move, um, I think, uh, are very you know, um, tangible to uh, younger generations and places where broader thinking about economics uh, could come in very, uh, be very useful. There's some eco e ecological e economists who are saying, well, well, one way we can move towards a more sustainable economy is reduce the length of the, the work week. Uh, people can enjoy more leisure, you know, less, uh, hopefully less, you know, uh, fossil fuel oriented uh, consumption. Um, but some of the proposals are for cutting the work week by a day. If you actually look, if you look at it from the point of view of a parent responsible for um, smaller school age children, that's not going to be so helpful. That means four days a week you're still trying to make the you know get to the daycare center before it closes, and you've got all of that kind of stuff going on, um, or arranging after school care uh, and the rest. So when you put the two together, it might be you know feminist input into that question of working hours might uh, be talking about a shorter working day. Uh, rather than a shorter working week by the time you count in um, the way that, that uh, uh, child care and other things tend to be scheduled. I would say I, I have gotten more um, concerned with, with the ecological issues, particularly as climate change has become um, you know, increasingly uh, obviously real. Uh, I become concerned with this, this kind of backlash, like I said, this um, stereotype creating literature coming out of behavioral economics on so-called uh, gender differences. Um, I guess my attitude towards the, towards the profession has become ne neither more optimistic nor pessimistic. Uh, my attitude towards the uh, progress of the things I'm interested in the world took a big setback this last November <laughs> in the U.S. elections. Um, so it's a, you know, it's always been a, a, a tough time to be working on these issues, and that just got a whole lot tougher to be working on uh, uh, feminist and ecological concerns in a U.S. context, uh, given the 2016 elections. Mm -hmm.